my absolute privilege to present Mark to you all for his presentation. He's probably the nicest, most likable guy in the program. I consider it an absolute pleasure to have known him these past few years. Um, he first developed his love for the gustatory, the beautiful, the beauty in the olfactory when he was working as a baker in his first job. However, he didn't follow that passion to a full career, instead going to um, Cal Poly to earn his bachelor's in graphic communication. After which he became the fourth generation in his family to work in printmaking with a long and successful career, respected by his peers. But he still had this just love for the art of food and wine and all of this. And so he cut his teeth in this passion for wine by starting his own small production, Fair Oak Cellars, making a few bales of wine, which are truly beautiful, delightful wines. But he found more joy in wine than he did in his career. So he pivoted out of there and started studying wine here at UC Davis, hoping to eventually start his own winery in a full-scale production. He, um, while studying at UC Davis, he worked at Binda Bottle, a very large crust and crush facility where he made a whole lot of styles of wine, even wine cocktails and other cocktails. And after he graduates, he's going to work at Cardinal in Napa Valley, making some very high and expensive wines. Um, it's been amazing to know him these past two years, and I cannot wait to see what he has to present for us. And with that, Mark. Okay. Thanks, Preston. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for joining today. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, ignore that we're in the midst of all this COVID-19 craziness. Uh, but thanks for, for coming out anyway and joining. And um, for this hour, I just want to, to invite you to, to take a step back from all this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, stuff to uh, put aside uh, thinking about flattening the curve, to uh, not be smirking at people hoarding toilet paper, um, and this to, uh, to come together and, and think about wine and uh, the topic of wine. We're going to share a couple things today. I'm going to share my, uh, my desktop uh, right now, and then in just a moment, I'll start. Um, start my presentation. But um, if you can just imagine uh, with me uh, right now that, that it's the middle of summer, it's a really hot day and you're in wine country and uh, you're standing outside of a barrel room and uh, you're starting to sweat because it's so hot and but you, you step into the barrel room and it's nice and cool and the door closes behind you and you take a breath and it's this most wonderful smell. It's one of my favorite, favorite smells of all time, um, smelling what's in, uh, uh, in a barrel room. And uh, so I've always been curious, uh, there's a lot of mystery on where, where that, that wonderful smell comes from and, and uh, how these, these great wines come out of oak barrels. And uh, so I wanted to um, uh, research uh, some of that. I think one of the things that uh, I've enjoyed most at UC Davis is the really easy ability to, uh, for free, access a lot of papers. And uh, so I was able to, to read a lot about um, chemical reactions that uh, happen to wine uh, while they're aging in oak barrels. And I wanted to, to share some of that uh, with you today. And uh, so I'll do a, just a quick overview and then uh, talk in some key themes that uh, I ran across in literature and then uh, wrap up with uh, a couple thoughts on what that all means. So wines that are uh, considered to be high quality are often aged in, in oak barrels, particularly uh, red wine, but oak barrels are expensive. I, I got a really good deal on my last barrel, but it was still uh, $900 or so for a French oak barrel. It'd be a little less for, for US. Um, so that's a, a, a big outlay, and it's kind of important to understand uh, what a barrel can do to help uh, make informed decisions about uh, barrel aging, whether you're going to, to do that or not, and uh, how much new oak to use and so forth. And there is really a ton of literature uh, out there. It's kind of exciting uh, taking a look, but so much that I wanted to, to focus and uh, focus it down to... Uh, uh, 15 of, of the more important uh, volatile compounds that you get by, by aging in, in, uh, in oak and uh, looking at barrels versus oak additives and then finally wrapping up with some, some thoughts on color. 
So these are the uh, uh, 15 volatile compounds that uh, that I wanted to to touch on. Um, so so their name, the uh, the rough perception threshold, you can at, least, at least the order of magnitude should have uh, some meaning there. And then uh, con typical concentration uh, by months, and then uh, wh what it actually smells like. And uh, looking at how um, literature discusses these different compounds, um, they tend to, to break it up on uh, uh, group the compounds in, in how they're formed. And so you have some that are just extracted from the wood. Uh, some are also extracted, but just from the surface. Um, then you have uh, also uh, compounds that are, that are released and, and react with precursors in the wine. Uh, then also oak barrels have uh, some, some oxygen transfer going on. So uh, compounds that are formed by oxidation taking place and also uh, compounds that are disappearing uh, because of uh, oxidation taking place. And uh, there are a few other ways that, uh, that compounds can disappear as well. And those can have to do with uh, condensing um, with compounds that are extracted from the wood. Um, they could be uh, absorbed back into the wood and uh, then also there's some compounds and it, it just has to do with the, the acid and alcohol uh, ester equilibria. So taking a look at uh, uh, extraction factors, um, how, what changes the, the extraction of what, what compounds you get uh, in the barrel, um, the species, whether that be uh, French oak or American oak or uh, some other kind, um, has, has a big uh, impact. Also where that species is grown. Um, and there's, there's a, uh, not a whole lot of agreement on, on stave seasoning. There are, there are some papers that say, well, they're microorganisms and they, they uh, get in and they do something uh, that we're not quite sure what to, to the wood, but then other papers say, well, you're, you're really shaving all that off, so it shouldn't have any effect. Um, so there's not a whole lot of agreement there. Um, the barrel age, uh, how many times it's used, of course, uh, has a big impact. And then obviously your contact time with, with wood. One of the things that I wasn't expecting to find was that um, the wine itself is a, is a big factor on uh, uh, what uh, compounds uh, uh, end up uh, in the wine. And this is a, a, for an interesting study. They took um, four different uh, varieties of grapes and uh, made the same same wine, same uh, winemaking uh, procedure. And then they uh, stored it in uh, a uh, Spanish uh, variety of oak, French oak and American oak. And you can see that uh, just by having the different varieties with different amino acid composition and so forth. Uh, like if you take a look at uh, Bierza wine um, and uh, let's see and uh, take a look at the, uh, the roasted uh, attribute there, and then uh, take a look at, at Rioja. So that's uh, with this, the same barrels, but just a different, um, different variety. Uh, you're, you're getting different compounds uh, in the wine there. Um, looking at, at toast, um, as you toast the oak, it breaks down the, the lignin and um, it results in uh, phenolic ketones and aldehydes uh, like glycol and uh, eugenol. And uh, I'll just go back for a second. So glycol has a kind of a smoky, uh, sweet uh, aroma and eugenol uh, has a spicy, spicy clove. And um, there were a, a couple of papers that, that talked about uh, what's, uh, what's more important, uh, where the oak comes from, like, like France or US, um, or is the toast more important? And uh, this uh, graphic here, uh, we're looking on the y-axis, the uh, uh, how intense, uh, an intensity score for sensory, uh, how much that was sensed for um, three, three of the main uh, oak aromas, and both for, for French oak and American oak. Um, and as you, as you can see, you, you would expect a little more coconut in the American oak, and we're, we're seeing that. 
and uh, they, they, uh, their main finding was that uh, at higher toast, it was more difficult for people to tell the difference uh, between the origins, between French and American. So if you're getting a, a heavy toast uh, barrel, and um, you might you might think about uh, where you, the the price of the barrel more than uh, exactly where you want uh, the wood to come from. And uh, so another interesting thing I found that I wasn't really uh, expecting was that uh, the first uh, few months are are really critical. There's a quick initial extraction, and then the kinetics of the extraction uh, changes. And uh, this graphic was, was a good one to show that. And then the first few months, you're just pretty much extracting, extracting. And uh, then the wine soaks into the wood about as much as it's going to. And then you have uh, some, some compounds uh, start to, to get back uh, into the wood. So this is a, a, a good example is a concentration on the y-axis, you have concentrations of uh, uh, some compounds. And then uh, over time, aged in barrels, the uh, blue is, is aged in new barrels. Uh, the yellow is aged in, in barrels that have been used for one year. So if we take a look at syringaldehyde, <coughs> which has a kind of a sweet, uh, sweet aroma to it there, uh, we can see that that uh, up up to about uh, nine months, it's it's uh, increasing, and then it really uh, takes a hit, and that tends to correspond right about with uh, the wine uh, uh, soaking in as much as it's going to uh, in the barrels. So taking a look at a few uh, specific uh, compounds, uh, vanillin concentration. Um, so we have uh, micrograms per liter on the y-axis and uh, uh, weeks on the x-axis. Um, the vanillin is formed as uh, lignin is, is uh, degraded while the barrel is being, being made. And uh, the amount in there varies uh, by the toasting heat. Um, and uh, some of it, if you have lees um, in, the, in the barrel, some of, some of that uh, vanillin will get converted to uh, vanilla alcohol. And it tends to uh, get formed by two different mechanisms. You have uh, first some direct extraction, and that's uh, easiest to see in the, the model wines posted here. And then uh, after that, there's some oxidation of, of lignin, uh, in which case you can, you can still get uh, more vanilla in there. Um, looking at uh, oak lactone, the uh, cis oak lactone that you would uh, tend to find uh, a bit more of in, in French oak and the trans oak lactone that you'd uh, find more of uh, in, in American oak. Um, you, you can see that uh, again, the first for the first uh, uh, a few months, you get uh, a lot more in it. And then uh, if you keep on aging, um, you're going to get uh, a bit less of that. So I'd, I'd, I'd seen, um, like some wines, they're just aged like six months, nine months in barrel. And I always wondered why that is, but it's one way to get more of some compounds uh, if that's what you'd like. <clears throat> so these are a lot of good things, but uh, I did want to touch on uh, 4-ethylphenol and 4-ethylglycol because it's not all roses. And, and speaking of roses, it has nothing to do with, with barrels, but uh, you can get a rose honey odor from 2-phenylethanol, uh, one of the, the uh, higher alcohols. But uh, getting back to 4-ethylphenol and 4-ethylglycol, um, it's linked to uh, Brettomyces and Dicara yeasts. And um, they work on, uh, on uh, cumaric and, and ferulic acid, uh, mostly, uh, decarboxylation of those. And then you get the, the nice Brett aronia as a barnyard and medicinal, old band-aid, old style band-aids, old leather. And uh, some people like Brett, but I think most people would not like too much Brett. So it's something that, that we have to be uh, aware of. And uh, because barrels are so porous, um, they're really conducive to uh, spoilage by this kind of yeast activity. And uh, 
a number of, pace, of uh, papers talked about uh, mitigation strategies. Uh, they all agreed to, to keep your dissolved oxygen level uh, low and uh, higher cellar humidity helped. And then uh, steam treating barrels with sulfur dioxide gas seemed to be uh, the most effective for keeping the concentration down. Taking a look at wood, uh, uh, the wood itself uh, on oxygen transfer and then taking a look at lees. And uh, on wood, uh, depends on the porosity, so the time of time of uh, uh, year that uh, uh, a stave would have grown in the tree, um, and as well as permeability, and then keeping in mind, in mind that the the oxygen is going to react with uh, phenolic compounds in the wine, and so it depends on the wine matrix itself, um, what's going to happen uh, with that oxygen that does transfer through. Um, Lees had a bigger uh, effect in the barrel than, than I'd originally uh, expected. It, it binds uh, to some compounds itself. Uh, it also binds to some oxygen, so it's uh, keeping uh, some oxygen for itself and making it not available for uh, other reactions. And then uh, whether it's you're filtering or not, um, if you have Lees and uh, you don't filter, you're going to have uh, more of uh, larger compounds, like uh, I think uh, eugenol is one of those. And then if you do filter after you have leaves, you'll have more uh, smaller compounds. So the, the leaves uh, have an impact uh, whether, whether or not you're going to, to filter there. Um, this was uh, uh, in interesting uh, pointing out leaves as a, a sensory uh, principal component analysis. And uh, you see the uh, control wines uh, up at the top here, and then uh, the same wine, but with lees added, and then uh, the same lees, but with some enzymes added, and uh, you're getting a, a kind of a nice, nice finish, uh, nice, nice fullness of the mouthfeel there. So uh, the lees in the barrels are, are definitely impacting uh, what's happening there. There's a lot of literature also about uh, barrels versus oak additives. So I wanted to, to take a look at a couple aspects there. Um, oxygen transfer rates. Um, so a, a, an oak barrel uh, tends to uh, let in about 1.66 to 2.5 milligrams of oxygen per liter per month. And uh, that tends, seems to be the way um, most of the literature uh, uh, describes the oxygen. Um, I found it interesting, Dr. Oberhorster and, uh, and colleagues had found that even if you're just storing in a stainless steel tank, you're gonna get some uh, oxygen transfer rate. And then uh, if you're doing a study and you're trying to, to mimic the oxygen transfer rate um, of, that happens in a barrel using micro-oxygenation, uh, most studies would either use one or two uh, milligrams of, of uh, oxygen per liter per month. And then there were some uh, studies that uh, used microox uh, more intensively. Uh, here's an example of one that they were trying to, to stabilize color just with uh, uh, microox, and uh, they're adding uh, three to nine milligrams per liter per month. Also, I just uh, wanted to touch on, on really quick that the Depending on on the treatment, whether you're you're aging in, in barrels or you're doing uh, microox uh, only with no kind of oak additive, or or doing microox with uh, some other kind of uh, oak additive like chips or staves, that uh, the chemical composition of your wine is going to be somewhat different. Um, just taking a quick example, looking at the residual sugar on uh, American and French barrels. And uh, with, with uh, some conditions, that, that could be doubled depending on, on the, the treatment there. Also, the, uh, the sensory um, impact is, is going to be very different. You have uh, French oak, uh, wine stored in French oak here, American oak here. Uh, this is microox with uh, this oak chips added. Uh, this is microox with staves. Uh, this was just microox, no oak at all added. And then microox with, uh, with some, some tannin extract added. And I, I show this just to point out that depending on the treatment, you're going to get a uh, different, different uh, 
uh, descriptive analysis, sensory descriptive analysis. And I also wanted to point out another thing that um, if you're just doing uh, microox or maybe microox with uh, some tannin extract, you can get a cooked uh, vegetable vegetable flavor, which um, probably uh, is not desirable in in uh, uh, any high quality wine and uh, probably doesn't increase the, the value of, of any wine. But I point this out because there's a, a, another study um, that talked about uh, sensory differences by aging method. And they also had a uh, vegetal in their, their PCA. And uh, if you, you take a look at, at where those happened, that was with, uh, with no oak. There's um, uh, microoxygenation with no oak and also uh, just just nothing. You just put it in the tank. You didn't do microoxidation or uh, uh, or oak uh, additive at all. And uh, so that happened in 2004. I'm not sure what happened in 2005. That was uh, shifted things a bit. But uh, just to be aware that um, microoxygenation on its own uh, might not be the best path to uh, to wine you're trying to make. Um, taking a look at uh, color. Uh, looking at, at uh, permanent pigment, it's not just a, a matter of um, getting everything you can out of the grapes uh, before you, you press it off, but it's uh, uh, chemical reactions that, that happen over time. And uh, I'd use this picture. Uh, this was taken last night. And um, anybody have a guess what year this is? Go ahead and, and unmute yourself and... Uh, just shout out a year if you can guess. 2016. Who is that? Jason. Jason, you know what this wine is, Jason. <laughs> okay, so um, it is from 2016. Uh, this is a Petite Syrah that uh, I made back then. And I use this as an example because uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it, but when I was taking uh, barrel samples um, and looking at them in a grass, glass, it was just beautiful. There was color all the way out to the edge. There wasn't this clear rim that you see right here after being in a bottle for a while. And uh, you can see that, the, that there is um, uh, uh, plenty of permanent uh, pigment developed there, but that those uh, monomeric anthocyanins that uh, drop out in the first year or two um, happened, with, happened with this wine as well. Taking a look at um, stable color differences uh, over time. So this is um, looking at total polymeric pigment uh, on the y-axis and then uh, uh, aging and then uh, different treatment here. And if you look at this, it's like, wow, man, I should, uh, I should just do microox and, and add some tannin extract and, and I'll get uh, lots of color. But uh, keep in mind, this is uh, total polymeric pigment. And uh, it doesn't mean that that's going to be the same uh, color all the time. So uh, this is another um, uh, PCA with different, uh, different treatments. Um, treatments with a T is from a tank, uh, UB is used barrels, NB is new barrels, uh, MO is uh, microoxygenation, and then the, the numbers, uh, the first number would be uh, number of months uh, stored uh, in, in with that kind of treatment, and if there's a plus, that's plus uh, six months in bottle. So you can see there's, uh, there's change in, in the color uh, in the bottle as well. And uh, just wanted to, to point out that, uh, that uh, all, all of these uh, different treatments um, are gonna result in, in different colors. So if you use something other than, a, than an oak barrel, um, the color could be, could be somewhat different. And um, if you remember, uh, it must have been uh, one, of the, one, one of the last, um, uh, lectures we had in the in the sensory theater, uh, Dr. Veronique Chenier came and gave a Rossi lecture. I was really excited because she specializes in this and it's like, okay, so how do you predict uh, what color you're going to get 
by the treatment. And uh, I was so excited she was coming because then I would listen to what she had to say and then I'd be able to share with you, ah, this is how you predict your color. But um, unfortunately she said uh, that uh, it's really difficult because there, there are at least thousands, if not tens of thousands of reactions and, and compounds uh, that are contributing to the color. And so it's really difficult to make any prediction right now. I think as time goes on um, and technology gets a bit better, hopefully we'll be able to, to pull some trends for, for what's uh, uh, happening and that those will be able to use um, for uh, winemaking decisions uh, as well. So what does all this mean? There's still a lot of mystery uh, about what happens to wine and oak barrel. And I, I kind of like that, I think it's cool. But when you're trying to make decisions to, uh, to produce a specific wine, uh, it does help to, to have some information about so what uh, compounds uh, barrels can add to wine and how quickly those are added and uh, what factors uh, impact um, what compounds are gonna be formed in the barrel. Oak barrels are expensive, but the impact of oak barrels on wine can't yet be fully replicated with uh, less expensive alternatives. If I were making uh, wine, just planning a wine right now, uh, if I wanted to lay something down for a long time in a cellar and bottles, uh, I would consider still uh, sticking with oak barrels. And uh, if I was trying to produce a, a very high-end wine where customers were expecting a, a certain color and, and hue and uh, other attributes, um, again, uh, oak barrel might, might be a, a good thing to, to consider there. So thank you so much for, for coming out of the, uh, this uh, COVID-19 craziness and uh, spending some time with us uh, thinking about wine. Um, I would like to particularly thank uh, Dr. Waterhouse for um, all the uh, kind words of, of wisdom that he's uh, shared with me and also helped me to, to link my passion for making wine to, uh, to some of the, the chemistry uh, behind it. I've just found that fascinating. Um, I'd also like to, to thank uh, Dario for helping me be able to communicate uh, some of this uh, a little bit better. And uh, for my cohort, um, just starting this journey together um, at UC Davis, and I'm, I'm sure we will uh, stay in touch as we, we move out of the industry. Um, but most importantly, I just, I want to uh, thank my husband, Dave. Uh, some of you know that uh, Dave for five years took at least one prerequisite class with me every term. Uh, to, uh, to help me get into UC Davis. He took those classes with me. So he's been uh, tremendously supportive uh, through this whole process. And uh, it's exciting having, having uh, got to look at um, some of the science behind winemaking and uh, I'll be able to, to use that as a tool set uh, as we go out to making wine in the future. So I'll go ahead and uh, Stop, stop sharing. And were there any questions? Nobody had any questions. Yes, I have one. I'm oh yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I would like to know if you get some information about the effect of the, uh, the alternative uh, additions uh, during fermentations on the wine profile? Um, I did not look at um, uh, the, the, the addition during fermentations. I, I did see uh, quite a bit of that at Binda Bottle, that uh, people, especially chips, there are people who are putting so much chips in, you wondered if it, the um, the must pump was going to get stuck, but it always pumped right through. Um, so I know that there is a, um, a lot of uh, literature available for that, but that wasn't one of the, the focuses that I had. Okay. Thanks, Guillermo. Oh, Anyone else? Yeah, if I can ask a question. Yeah. 
You said that high cellar humidity led to lower instances of Britannomyces infection. Right. Yeah, they, they theorized that it was just because it, it reduced the <coughs> oxygen transfer rate uh, through the barrels. And so there wasn't as much dissolved oxygen. Okay. Um, so it wasn't so much that independently they, they thought. Um, it's just re reduced, reducing the DO. Mm -hmm. 